Bonjour à tous, uh, good afternoon to all. It's always very difficult to be the last speaker just before lunch. <laughs> and uh, uh, I mean, but uh, I, uh, I remember, uh, you know, we had a, uh, one of the speakers uh, had to decline. And uh, when I said that, uh, should I read a paper? And uh, my co-convener said, ma'am, you can't read a paper, you're the convener. Mm -hmm. And I said, uh, I think, uh, uh, I said, no, 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 why not? I have something to say. And that is, uh, so this is not really a paper which I'm reading. This presentation is mainly a, a humble tribute to a person who has uh, inspired me to learn the Konkani language and to use it. Because uh, I remember when I came to Goa, uh, when, it, when I met him, he said, uh, you know, it was, must have been after six months, and he said, uh, you speak Konkani? And I said, no. He says, uh, oh, but if you have to live in Goa, you have to learn Konkani. And uh, I remember that really uh, inspired me to learn this language. My association with uh, Dr. Manohar Sardisai is from 1991, when he came as an external examiner, when I did my MPhil at the Jawaharlal Nehru University, and I had the pleasure of meeting him. Uh, I just want to share a small experience, because I think this is really something uh, which talks uh, uh, you know, volumes of the kind of person he was. I remember I finished my viva, he said it was very good, uh, and uh, everything went off very well, and I came back, I went back to Pune, because I was from Pune, and uh, he uh, came back to Goa, I guess, I just met him once, and uh, about 15 days later, I received an inland letter. And I said, uh, inland letter, at the back it said, an address which I did not recognize, it said Teofilo Braga, and I said, uh, I don't know this place, but uh, when I opened the letter, you will not believe it. It was a letter written to a student telling me that he, how much he enjoyed reading my work and uh, that uh, he did not want to return the copy which was given to him. And that, uh, uh, you, know, that uh, uh, you know, that he was, uh, he, re he really admired uh, the kind of work I was doing and he wanted me to continue with his blessings. And with his blessings, I'm here standing before you today. And uh, this is all about translating. Uh, Dr. Manohar Rai said this. I have had the uh, honor and the privilege to translate a few poems, including Maje Geet, Magne, and uh, Ashar for uh, the uh, multi the, the trilingual anthology of poetry. Uh, but uh, this is now, I think, before lunch, something a little different. And uh, I, uh, you know, I said I speak. Uh, Kokani, and I do, and I read, and I understand, and I have been translating. But I'm going to invite a young student from the Konkani department to read a few lines of his poem, of which I'm going to talk about. Namaskar. Majanao Devita Ishwar Kure, and how Shanegarabha Pashani Saiti Masha Icha Kokani, Adhyan Shakir Chavidyatini. Uh, Madam in Sangladeshe, how Munurai Sardes and Chepe Benche Kazar, Yakovici, Kai Wari to Jamka Sadrakurta Pariacha Sarkatoria, the Paz Bebe Rautale Pariacha Sarkatoria, the Paz Bebe Rautale, but put it to Doret and Che, Ani Yangan Watkwe Patsuizan Bao Bao, Bareter in Sultale. Pazuizan, bow, bow, bareter in Sultale, Sansvera, Madatara, Katra Subit Muntale. Darao, 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 Ami Paska bow. Darao, 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 Ami Paska bow. Mandaviche Patsetigir, my Mogandra. It labore de Knebebe, Connets Uzun de Clena. It labore de Knebebe, Connets Uzun de Clena, Tanchevari Udkumaru, Connak Uzun Zamlena. Jenna bebe would give married, a cavalry to Sultale. Jenna bebe would give married, a cavalry to Sultale. Amchanavia sir Karache, Montricoche, this tale. Amchanavia sir Karache, Montricoche, this tale. Do very good. So you have just listened to the first five stanzas of the Kokini ballad. I call it a ballad. Bebe Chikaza by Manur Rai Sardesai, first published in the Diwali special issue in 1964. A rhythmic and rhyming poem. This is a remarkable example of sound poetry, 
an emanation of the oral language intended to be read and listened to and transmitted essentially by the oral voice for and by a diverse audience. Uh, so I would first like to uh, congratulate uh, uh, Sumesh Sardesai for having so beautifully translated this poem first into English. And, uh, and uh, I must say that uh, I cannot deny that I was uh, also inspired by the English version which has been so beautifully done. And uh, I took it up from there. In the translation of such type of poetry, it is certain that sound is an aesthetic factor that needs to be considered beyond the structure, semantics, and cultural context of the text. And to arrive at the French version of this poem of 55 quatrains or stanzas, the challenge was to restore a poem to the level, firstly, of semantics, the message, grammaticality, the, uh, grammaticality or acceptability, the structure, because it is quatrain four, four line stanzas, which are the cornerstone of this poem, each quatrain telling a story, a short story, and it, it is a whole in itself with a concept and a mission. Secondly, the sound, thus the sonority, rhythm, and rhyme of the poem, while respecting the diversity of the sounds and images evoked by the original text. If all such translation involves two stages, decoding, which means reading, reformulation, which means writing, uh, in uh, sound poetry, there's also alliteration, assonance, onomatopoeia, uh, sounds like dara on dara, which you just hear, uh, you know, which are not the sounds of a French frog, unfortunately. <laughs> and uh, so in the French frog, we say qua, qua, uh, or uh, say weep, weep, uh, depending on uh, the size of the frog, I guess. And uh, eventually, all this can have multiple translations, uh, depending on the level of faithfulness that the source text, uh, you know, that the transla translator wishes to maintain, and of course, the level of experimentation which the translator is ready to, uh, you know, take on. Uh, our first observations on reading the poem is that there is a simplicity of language which is used, uh, you know, uh, because. Uh, poem written in a language which is complex, with complex diction and syntax, changes in tones and layout, such as in the case of the fourth stated Atrajun or some of the other poems. Um, I have uh, essayed to, uh, you know, which I have also essayed to translate for the trilingual uh, anthology. Uh, this, uh, you know, presented a little different kind of problem. Uh, reflecting on the linguistic differences and similarities between Konkani and French, I must say that Manohar Bab himself had pointed out in an article on, uh, entitled Interférence des langues régionales et autres dans l'apprentissage du français, uh, uh, published in uh, 1995 in the Bulletin of the Menezes Braganza Institute, uh, and I quote, Konkani is like the dialects of the south of France, more sing-song than standard French, but the tonic stress is on the last syllable, like in the Konkani language and in French. Moreover, there is a curious resemblance between French and Konkani phonetics as far as nasal vowels are concerned, which is absent in both Marathi and English. He gives the example of kanda, onion, <laughs> and kano, onion. And, uh, Consonants also, which uh, in Portuguese may be what is what we call schwantons or the sh, uh, are, it will be sir in both Kokani and French. So we have pes, pespan and pesh. Uh, on the syntactic level also, he define, identifies a resemblance between French and Kokani with an absence of the present continuous as in Hindi and English. So uh, now that I'm going to give a sigh of relief because that is going to help me further. His observations led us to believe that translating poetry, especially sound, sound poetry from Kokani to French, must be easier than into English or Portuguese. And this is for two reasons other than the one that's cited above. The first is the fewer endings in French compared to English or Portuguese, and the similarity of endings between Kokani and French, something that was immensely reassuring when it came to this particular poem. Taking the example of the A that is seen in the word's ending, with over 40 rhymes, there are 40 lines which end with the A. 
uh, that can be rendered using uh, the imperfect or the past participle. So you have rautale, abite, saltale, marche, montale, dize, distale, paresse, zale, so passe, santale, raconte. Uh, so you have this uh, amazing resemblance and that's going to help us in our, the translation of this poem. If the first step is to arrive at somewhat uh, literal translation, I'll be quite flat and uh, prosaic, it would be essential uh, to take care of the words and their meanings, which would essentially center around the vocabulary of two things in this poem, uh, obviously the frog and marriage, or the wedding. Uh, this is what brings us to the first challenge of this poem, uh, and that is the French word for the word frog. Uh, the, in the French word for the frog is La Grenouille, uh, whereas we all know that the heroes of this poem are all male. And uh, in Cotinivia, confronted the, with the words bebo, bebe, bebki, bebkyo, and the diminutive bebkulio, in French, the word khanui doesn't offer many possibilities. And uh, it offers, shall I say, fewer possibilities, and uh, in rhyme, and fewer, even fewer possibilities which will help us to find the rhyming words. Uh, not only because la is a very lengthy word, but it, uh, but it presents a semi-vowel uh, uh, and a semi-vowel combination uh, with the U and the E, uh, uh, making the search for synonyms for frogs uh, very important to this process. So for this, uh, you know, uh, the, there were several choices. Personne ne vit de Bacracien Ardon. Bacracien comes from Bacracia, which is uh, the Greek word meaning a group of modern frogs, the non-extinct ones. Uh, uh, then you have un beau jour, un vieux crapaud sage, a crapaud, un vieux crapaud. I mean, it reminds me of the uh, very, uh, you know, because it's um, uh, Dr. Sabri Sabri, I can say that it reminds me of, there's a very, very famous restaurant that's been there for almost all the time, near the Arc de Triomphe, which is called un vieux crapaud. And, uh, and this, uh, you know, this uh, translation, uh, so you, you can have the uh, Bacrasien or Via Capo. You have, uh, when you're talking about the ladies, you can talk about Renette Ravissante, uh, with the Renette uh, meaning uh, small, slender, uh, thin, green frogs. And then you have Les uh, Grenouillettes, because we can always use that in French, and any word which can be made diminutive by using the et. So you have Grenouillettes, and then uh, you also have uh, fee grenouille, etc. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, the generic term is ophidian. So uh, you know, I kind of use all these words somewhere in the text so that you know the French they like to uh, you know have a variety uh, in their uh, writing and they don't like repetition much. So that is what it is. So if cultural context is that fine. Uh, if cultural context and symbols uh, play an important role in meaning, it is interesting to note that the actors of these poems are frogs. Frogs are common cultural objects in almost all cultures across the world, be it in Africa, East Africa, East Asia, South America, and they all symbolize fertility, prosperity, and good luck, among others. Uh, even the Rig Veda has a hymn known as the Frog Song. Uh, which is the Mandala 7.103, dedicated to the frog, praising them for their wisdom, unity, and the good luck they bring. Their voices heralding the advent of the rainy season. So, uh, you know, the frog, the frog remains. And uh, uh, the cultural di uh, elements in this poem are vividly portrayed through the descriptions of the locations, characters, the unfolding of the story of the frog's wedding, depicting the duality, duality of Goan culture, its Hindu culture, its Catholic culture, it presents a cultural amalgamation of the wedding process and at the same time juxtapositions, tradition and modernity. The choice of the word Kazar in itself uh, is a loan word from the Portuguese and uh, so you can, place, you can place this poem very easily in the Indo-Portuguese or the Goan Portuguese uh, literary context. And So uh, when we have uh, the description of the attire, wedding attire, uh, you know, I uh, 
you have the uh, the Kogri version there. It says, "Les époux se firent de belles tenues de soirée en feuilles bananier toutes vertes. Chacun portait une cravate d'hibiscus et se dirigeait vers Zgao à la fête. Les mariés et elles portaient dans les cheveux des diadèmes en fleurs de poisson et des saris fabriqués en pétales de lotus sur le pont et la les rendre. Uh, so, um, so you so you have this this whole setting of the social. Uh, the set setting before us, the political setting, of course, uh, was uh, evoked in, uh, in a verse uh, read out by the young uh, um, yeah, student. And uh, in the French, it reads as, chaque fois qu'il se déplaçait en sautant et en marchant à la queue le leur, du gouvernement qu'on venait d'élire, dirait-on, c'était les députés vainqueurs. So uh, this was the, uh, the French. Uh, of course, uh, the social context also required uh, the use of some gallicisms. Uh, you know, this is the French uh, version of the anglicisms. And uh, so, you know, some kind of words uh, like uh, allusions to some poems which are uh, quite uh, iconic uh, when they are, uh, you know, uh, when you say, Aplo Mano Sakal Dadun, then you say, Les garçons se trouvaient honteux et confus from the very famous Corvo et de Renard. And uh, uh, similarly, you know, it, in, uh, in many other uh, contexts, this, uh, uh, you know, Gallicism had to be known in Le Nous Restera Plou en Rang, etc., which is very uh, uh, well known. Si jamais l'on rentre le soir un peu tard, elle pleurera comme une madeleine. Et si l'on décide de prendre un verre dans un bar, elle nous fera ressentir la peine. So uh, this, uh, you know, the, the, the allusions to the Madeleine, uh, crying like the Madeleine, or that's, that's very French, and I, uh, I thought it was interesting if you're carrying this poem overseas that you uh, bring in some kind of a, a French flavor to, uh, to this, uh, uh, to this uh, poem. And uh, I, I mean, I, I need to give one more example, and that is of all the different types of frogs which at, who attend the wedding, the different enmities to this wedding. Uh, you have the, the different frogs who are invited to this wedding. Yeah, so, uh, uh, so the, this, you know, this, uh, the rhyming scheme is very dif uh, difficult in this. Uh, however, because if you have to really talk about all the enmities, you cannot change their identities. And uh, so, uh, the, you know, there are three different types of uh, um, things you can, you know, three types of techniques which you can use. Either you, uh, you know, you, you have an internal rhyme or you have a, a perfect rhyme, uh, like internal rhyme in the case of uh, grenouille déformé et grenouille dégarni. So you have an internal déformé, dégarni. Uh, whereas uh, uh, you can have a perfect rhyme, which is grenouille rieuse et grenouille pleureuse. So you have uh, uh, so you have a perfect rhymes here, uh, whereas in the others uh, the rhymes uh, you know uh, in very few instances, however, but but, it, but they deserve mention. Uh, you will have to find some uh, thing else when you say grenouille clairvoyant et grenouille mior, and then you say grenouille aveugle et grenouille sourd, grenouille plate et grenouille terni. But however, you have done an external rhyme and said grenouille clairvoyant et grenouille mior. Then I have Gruny Deformé, Gruny Degarni, and then afterwards I have Terni. So, uh, you know, so if there's some kind of a rhythm, some kind of a rhyme scheme, we cannot really do without it in any of the stanzas. Um, uh, so, uh, I mean, this is all, this has all been, uh, this is the, this has been a kind of a process, and I think this process, like uh, I said in my uh, abstract, it is a process of conformity at one level, of consensus at another level, uh, I mean, I have to uh, make my peace with the reader, and uh, of course, of contradiction at another. I mean, uh, and then you know, there's this whole thing of adapt adaptation, and how do you translate a word like cantar into French? Because uh, you know, it's not it's not just it's not a song, and it's uh, and uh, uh, with uh, I mean, I uh, uh, I must say it was it was difficult to get this in two places. Uh, where they were having, they were, there was the mention of the Qatar, and then to keep the rhyme, it went to rock and reggae. 
my excuses. Uh, so uh, that is what uh, it, it was. Um, so uh, then I, uh, if there has been much written about poetry translation by poets, translators, and literary critics, but very little has been written about how this, how to systemize this discipline or this process. Translation of poetry is probably a subject in translation studies that triggers the strongest polemics. Everybody has an opinion on whether a, a poem is well translated or not, and uh, uh, it is one of, and the, I think one of the most unimportant debates in this whole process is the question of translatability or non-translatability. I think everything is translatable. Uh, it's not worth spending time on that uh, because, of course, there is. Uh, commercial value to translations, of course, but more importantly, there are private, there's a huge private production of translations, and people are really enjoying this, uh, you know, uh, translating work from one language to another with no, uh, you know, um, with, with no, uh, uh, you know, uh, hope of uh, getting remunerated for the same, and that's, I think that is what the beauty is. Uh, the translation dilemma is then about creating a text, enabling a reader to accept the original. And different th theoretical approaches to translating poetry have been uh, talked about uh, generally on the semantic value of the original, the interlinear translation of a poem, the philological adherence to the text uh, while not maintaining its structure, inadequate poetic competence, uh, preservation of rhyme, rhythm, meter, dominant and subdominant cultural elements, and cultural transpositions. Uh, these are all viewpoints that uh, cannot really define how poetry should or should not be translated. And this brings me to the title of my presentation, Theories Past the Problems Remain, famous words of the French biolo biologist, naturalist, and philosopher, Jean Rostand. Consider a case such as mine, where I've decided to translate a poem after studying a foreign language your whole life. You want to put your talents to good use, Although translating poetry is a serious business, I have undertaken translation of uh, Manohrai Sardesai's poem simply by staying close to the poem, knowing and reading about the poet, showing grace and humility, staying uh, wary and taking a deep breath, or should I say several deep breaths. Putting poems into another language is one of the best ways to share culture, honor poets, and remind us that we can transcend geography. We can only do our best. Thank you, Dev Barikuru. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much, Professor. Uh, you really deserve a bravery award for taking on this enormous work because while the poem is fascinating in company, I think it's so difficult to translate. I can imagine what uh, challenges you face. We have a little time for questions. They were two very amazing papers. Uh, I know the first question is the toughest, but we have to go for lunch, so please start fast and we we'll wind up fast. <laughs> Otherwise, I'm going to provoke you with one question to both of you. I don't even want an answer. Unlike uh, my friend Shailendra Mehta, I cannot quote poetry and name poets, but I can ask questions. He made a suggestion about the untranslated uh, PhD of Dr. Sardesai. So, if we can keep that on the back burner somewhere. I'm not expecting an answer here from you, but you know if it could be done. Also, maybe an institution like Goa University, considering the multiplicity of languages, I at one stage counted that Goans had written and got published in about 22 or 23 different languages. So, maybe we need a translation center to work among China and Bath School. Questions? Don't waste the occasion. Two very interesting papers, very thought provoking, uh, both related to French. I don't think everyone is hungry. I think they are grappling with the realities of multilingualism. Yeah. And it's quite complex. And we had the samosas to our stomachs. <laughs> but uh, yeah, let's let's not uh, leave this chance to go waste. I think someone from the department itself, because you all are the best. Yeah, French, Professor Anthony. The ball is in your court. Yeah, Mike. Yeah? So, Edith, to remind us, Edith was talking about 
his writing, sorry, yeah, yeah. Okay, please. Uh, so I had one question for both uh, Ma'am Eden and Ma'am uh, Valke as well. They say uh, translators are traitors, right? So as, uh, you know, in the process of translating Ma'am Bones, uh, that's translated in your book, and Ma'am uh, Valke in uh, uh, my song, and also with the Kariya Chikazel and other works, how much do you think um, is a requirement of a translator to stay true to what is being said in the source text? Well, I can speak for myself that um, when you are translating, poems are particularly difficult. Uh, prose is easier, uh, but poems are difficult because there is the poet's emotion, uh, there is his rhyme or not, so I was not too much into rhyme and form, but it was more, you know, down pouring. So, um, so I didn't worry about the rhyme at all, but I tried to stay true to what he wanted to say as far as possible. And uh, I also kind of, um, you know, took in whatever he was saying and trying to understand the background of each poem. Um, there were some questions that I wanted to ask the family, but I didn't. Um, but you know, for some, for some later work maybe. But uh, I feel that you have to get into the poet's life also when you're translating, so that it doesn't become a superficial sort of thing. But yes, I try to stay faithful to the poet and to his language. Um. So uh, I agree with you, uh, you know, being faithful to the poet's messages uh, is above all. Uh, well, there's two schools of thoughts, uh, you know, like uh, what in French we love to call the Belles and Fidel, uh, which is the beautiful verses, but which are not faithful. And uh, then they have, uh, so, uh, you know, there are different, uh, there are different uh, takes on the kind of uh, uh, how poetry or any other text or any other literary text to be translated. I think, uh, well, in Bebeche Kazan, I, I mean, I was very clear about it. It had to be read, it had to read correctly, it had to read lyrically, and uh, so I had to make some compromises, and that uh, is fine as long as the, uh, the end product is good. Uh, which, uh, you know, poems which have deeper meaning uh, require a different process and a different way of treatment. And uh, I think that is uh, the kind of uh, poetry where you need to actually uh, know the poet very well, of course, but you must uh, know the uh, kind, of the, what is behind all of, uh, the poems, uh, the interlinear, uh, you know, reading of a poem. I think that is important. So I think it all depends on what you're translating. You know, translating something for yourself, go ahead and do what you want. Uh, thank you. <laughs> One question to the family to enter the realm of speculation. Supposing we had to ask Professor Sadisai to translate his own work into French. Translate, not write. What do you think he would have said? I suspect he might have refused. What do you think? <laughs> some themes, some themes like, like, you know, some themes are so local and the richness comes from the locality also so, so. Translating one's own uh, works. So I go back to uh, M. Mukundan that I had quoted here. You know. So he had written extremely uh, very, very poignant uh, short stories, and it was like a trilogy, key short stories. And I asked him to translate it because I was publishing it you know, in, for another journal. And I asked him why doesn't he do it because he was so uh, well versed in French. He says, you know, I'll never stop them because I keep thinking it should not have been like this. And then it becomes another work altogether. <coughs> I think a poet or any writer for that matter, when he or she wants to translate the work, it's very difficult for them because <coughs> it, he says it becomes another work. And also when you write in one language, and I think you have somebody in mind, a particular reader in mind. And when it's another language, somehow that changes uh, that's what I have heard from the writers themselves. So I don't know about how he would have reacted, you know, doing that himself. And I think there's a, there's a musicality that comes 
means uh, I don't know, continuing or from whatever you do, I think, which uh, is very difficult. You know, it, it some of his work. I think if, I, uh, if I'm not mistaken, my name was translated by him in, the, in English. Yeah? Yeah, yeah. He did translate some of his work. It's so very difficult to translate a poem or a poetry. Now, for example, if you study or uh, go through these poems, you find the Goa ethos which cannot be translated. That's what I feel. Yeah. Same thing with my father's story. My father was a Marathi short story writer, and uh, uh, many of uh, his admirers they wanted to translate his stories. And they found it very, very difficult, particularly the Pradeshi difficulties to call it. So that can be Rupandar, but that cannot be Shvashantar. Transliteration, in that sense. Yes. Thank you. Sorry. Yes. Recreation, yes. Yes. translation. For example, many English plays have been, uh, you know, they have, they have been changed. But that cannot be, uh, you know, change of language. Now everyone is getting excited and at this stage we have to stop because, <laughs> because lunch is awaiting. Uh, nonetheless, we appreciate the work of both the panelists. While, while we don't think that our criticism is against the translation, the work has to be translated. It may not be as satisfactory as when we experience it in Konkani, for example. But it has to go to the outside world and I think those uh, the writers who have got translated have got much more notice and it's a great effort. We really appreciate the contribution of both sir, of you. Can we take at least one question from students? Yes, please. Where is it? Now, yeah, we are doubting the existence of the question. <laughs> yeah, 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 they got it. Please. Mike Dita Maso. Good afternoon, uh, everyone. My name is Nikhil Pisuza, and I'm currently doing my master's in company language. The question that I had uh, for both of uh, you was that as a translator, what are the challenges or setbacks, hardships, what are the troubles that you all face, especially translating from languages like Konkani to French, French to Konkani, or English, translating something from uh, Konkani to English, because the rhythm, the 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 tal, the tal, the tal, the tal, the tal, how do you all bring it in the in languages like French or English? Well, like I said, um, to start with, uh, I'm not a translator, professional, or whatever, not even in my teaching. But I enjoyed translation, began to love translation when I did this work, okay? And uh, yeah, so what I did is, since I speak Konkani, uh, I don't write, but I speak. I don't read, but I speak. And when I read uh, in Romi script, I can understand. So I had to sit with a colleague and uh, work on this, okay? Because there were these finer things, you know, like kodo and uh, whatever, you know, grain of rice or what, small, small things that, um, that, um, of course, this I could understand, but there were some very minor details which uh, are written in his company and not my company. Uh, because this is the reality of Goa. I was just explaining to my uh, colleague, uh, to Dr. Brown, that we have, uh, in Christian company, we have north, south, totally different. Uh, we call them dialects, yes. And uh, we have the, um, the Hindu Konkani, different from the uh, whatever. It's, it's, it's nice, you know. It's, it's, it speaks of a variety. And we have to work on that and not try to make it all one. Leave the originality. And so um, this was my challenge, to understand the nuances. That's why I sat with someone who could help me with that, you know. So we used to exchange a lot of things and I used to put it in English and that's how the work was done, okay. So otherwise, besides that, there wasn't a major challenge because I, I, I could relate to Manahar Sardasai's company somehow. And it was written in Romi, which for my generation is very important because we didn't learn much of, of the Devanagari. 
Uh, you know, I think the biggest challenge uh, of writing uh, is translating to foreign languages acceptability in the Tagalog language. And uh, let me tell you that I, in spite of the fact that I've done French all my life, I uh, I never would publish and I never publish anything without having it read by a native speaker uh, to just know that it's there and there's no word which is wrongly used or, uh, you know, because there are some nuances in every language and we may not have had the grasp of just everything. Uh, this is something new when we speak, it's not, it's not a problem, we choose our words. When we translate, we need to choose the words. So uh, I think uh, uh, I think anybody who translates into any language, uh, and especially a foreign language, should make sure that it's read by a native speaker. And I always do this and uh, I think uh, it's a good practice for any translator. Thank you. Just, just to make, uh, to abuse my position, in the yes, one minute, one minute. Uh, I want to make two points here. The first point is I don't think we've understood or appreciated the importance of translation, especially in a globalizing world today. And uh, the second point is we have not been able, we failed to create a market for translations. And a whole lot of us are responsible, including publishers. Okay. But there are, there are grants, for example, which other countries give to translate, say, uh, Portuguese works into English, French works into English, if I'm not mistaken, German. Argentina approached us and said, we want to translate some work into some Spanish into English. But like, who's interested in Argentinian things here? And just because someone is going to give you money, the money, you can't just translate anything irrelevant. You know, but as a society, we need to, to create a market for translations. I don't know how that will happen. Especially for small languages, it's tough. But with the multilingual skills, I don't see a reason why Konkani cannot go directly into French or vice versa. Okay. Having said that, call this session to an end. The caterer is waiting for us. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Thank you, ma'am. I would kindly request Dr. Hanuman Chopnikar, the co-convener of this event, to offer mementos to the session chair. Dr. Frederick Narona and the panelists, Dr. Edith Narona, Melo Putado, and Professor Dr. Nurada Wagre.